The following podcast is a Dear Media production. Hi there, I'm Lauren McGoodwin with teammate Alia Kamalova. Welcome to The Females, a podcast from Career Contessa that delivers helpful, actionable career tips and advice for women so you can be more fulfilled, healthy, and successful at work. Today is the fourth and final episode of our month-long Power Move series to celebrate my new book, Power Moves, How Women Can Pivot, Reboot, and Build a Career of Purpose. And if you didn't know, Power Moves is officially out in the world. You can order it on Amazon or wherever you can purchase books, and it will actually show up on your doorstep. There's no longer a pre-order. It's just the real deal now. And if you can find out more information about the book, if you just want to go to Power Moves Book, Com. And I also wanted to share some recent reviews about Power Moves. This person said, Hi, Lauren, I have pre-ordered Power Moves and I'm so excited to binge listen to it tomorrow. I've listened to the introduction and first chapter this morning and the preview made me even more excited to read further. I was relating so well to all the points you made and it reaffirmed that pre-ordering the book was the best decision I've ever made. Ah, oh, that's so nice. Another person said, Hi, Lauren, I just wanted to let you know that I loved chapter one of Power Moves. Unlike so many other career books that just encourage you to hustle harder in pursuit of the dream, it assumes you already have and can articulate. This one hit me right where I am today, trying to figure out what I want out of life and career. One year out of undergrad and feeling completely purposeless, like the world has left me behind. I felt so encouraged yesterday to hear that you felt in a similar way. It made me feel like I'm not the only one who experiences this. I'm very excited to read the rest of the book when it releases, which of course you guys now know it has. And here are your tips for identifying and finding the courage to take the next right step. So thank you so much for those early reviews. Keep them coming. We, we love hearing from you guys. And if you want to know where you can actually leave reviews, of course, you can email us info at careercontested.com. But you can also leave reviews on Power Moves on Amazon, Goodreads. And of course, we will take your review on Apple Podcasts. So, all right. So my humble brag is done. (laughs) I'll move on to what this episode is actually about. So in this episode of our Power Move series, we're going to focus on everyone's favorite topic, money. We're going to go over why your net worth is not your self-worth and three money power moves that you can do today. And stick around for Dear Career Contessa, our listener advice segment where we answer your career questions, starting with, how can I succeed in my career despite the lack of team playerness of the department heads in my building? Plus, we also share some helpful resources you won't want to miss. And now this is The Females. When we talk about success and careers, it's hard to not think about money. And there's little doubt that when it comes to earning and managing money, that a lack of this resource can limit your career flexibility and critically impair your ability to make a power move. Having said that, many women, including many successful women, continue to struggle with money in concerning ways you know, from the things that are less in women's control, like the wage gap and the peak tax to a lack of financial confidence overall. Plus, women's issues with money also stem from irresponsible messaging that says how much we make defines who we are, that it's somehow a key indicator of our worth. The link between your salary and your feelings of success have been sort of hardwired into our brain. Right. And learning how to have a healthy relationship with money takes work. It's just like that plain and simple and yet not that simple at all. If we attach too much value to it, it can become a really dangerous relationship too. So similar to you know, most things in your life, your relationship with money is something that you have to continuously work on as well. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think so many people are constantly thinking about money. I mean, truly, since you're in like elementary school, it's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? What's like... I don't know. I feel like you're just hardwired into the economy, essentially. And so it's hard. You're like constantly thinking about it. But I don't think people too often think about what is my relationship with money. It's more of like, how do I get it? Do I have enough? How much does this person have? But not necessarily like, how does that reflect me personally and what I think? Right. And I think in the pursuit of more money or more things, I think no one ever stops to think about well, how do I feel when you know I feel like I'm making enough money or how do I feel when I think that I'm not being paid the market value for my skill. Like, mm-hmm. I, not to get like all woo-woo on everybody, but 
we always have to kind of go back to those that relationship and that self reflection and what money represents for a lot of us. I I mean, I'm speaking from experience as someone who has a very complicated relationship with money. I also in season, I think it was season two, I interviewed Jessica Knoll, who wrote this op ed for the New York Times, and it was I want to be rich and I'm not sorry. She basically was talking about how she had all these complicated feelings around saying that she wanted to be rich. And for women, especially this phrasing of rich can feel icky. So it's also really interesting to me just how big of a difference this relationship and the feelings that surround it can be for women versus men with money. Mm -hmm. And it's still glamorized, I feel like both ways, which is the weird part of it. It's like you still see, I don't know, people like celebs with like their mansions or whatever. It's like, it's still glamorized in a way of like, well, yeah, they're wealthy. But if you speak about like, I'm going to be rich. It's like, what? <laughs> I don't know. There's well, like, it's, I feel it's, like if you were at a cocktail party, and you told everybody your goal in life is to be rich. That would, I don't know. It's automatically, <laughs> yeah, it's automatically like, oh, that's your only goal. And right, <laughs> right. I, I also think that the reason why money was an important part for me to put into the book is because it is one of those resources where it does give you power. Mm-hmm. It does give you flexibility. It does give you you know, I'm sure all of us have heard of like FU money where you can like, if you have it, you get to make different decisions. So it's such, it's just a complicated thing. And it's really important that you get it on less complicated ground because it's going to be there through all parts of your life. That's why on today's episode, we're discussing one, why your net worth is not your self-worth and two, three money power moves you can do today. So let's get into it. So for many of us, your amount of income might also be the measure of your self-worth. It's no secret that society equates a higher salary to a higher status. However, your relationship with money should be balanced and thoughtful and constantly evolving like every relationship Mm -hmm. in your life. And one thing you mentioned in your book, Lauren, and something we've talked a lot about on Career Contessa is to stop believing your self-worth is your net worth. And you also mentioned some steps to combat this kind of thinking. And I just wanted to start with the first step, which is find examples in your life that are not related to money that make you feel good about yourself and share those moments with friends and family and even write them down as like a reminder for yourself. I think one of the reasons why I started saying this and writing about it in Career Contest long before the book, but part of it was my own relationship with money was this feeling of like, everyone kept saying, know your worth. What's your mm-hmm. worth? You know, ask for your worth. And I just, I have a real issue with that because your worth as a human, you're, you're priceless, right? Like you're already worth so much and, and your salary doesn't actually dictate what your worth is as a human. And so it's important that you consider this relationship because the goal is to really start associating your self-worth with feelings and experiences that deserve it and have nothing to do with your bank account. Because once you identify experiences that support your new mindset and you can seek out related opportunities that you can practice frequently, you're going to have a much healthier relationship, not only with money, but with your own self-worth. And and self-worth is already a complicated topic, Mm -hmm. but it is one of those things where it cannot be or it shouldn't be. It's not healthy for your self-worth to be wrapped up in a feeling of a bank account number because that number mm-hmm. is going to fluctuate. But you as a person are always going to be important and priceless and all the things. Yeah. And I think that writing down those other things that you value that's make you feel good and, I don't know, contribute to an, a sense of self-worth is such a great reminder to just be like, oh, there's a lot I can't control in terms of like how money is viewed like in society. You're not going to change like how others view you. Just starting with yourself and be like, I can attach my value to things that truly make me happy, people that surround me or whatever it is. Totally. I mean, for me, it's interesting because when I do volunteer related things, I I have a huge feeling of... um I don't don't necessarily know if it's self-worth, but like it really fills me up, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like that is such a good use of my time. I feel really worthy of that. Just makes me feel really good. And like, you know, I could be driving around in a a Range Rover. Would that make me feel good? Probably. I mean, I've never done it, but (laughs) probably (laughs) not in the same way that (laughs) that it does when I'm able to like it, it, that's just something I've noticed, like certain experiences. And, and, and But the reason why I noticed them is because when I was writing the book, I would do all these experiments to see like, 
you know, <laughs> does this actually work mm-hmm. or am I just blowing smoke up everybody's butt with this? But, and, and it does, or at least it did for me. But I think part of that comes from being conscious of it too. Mm-hmm. Another way to let go of the whole self-worth is my net worth mentality is to spend time with people whose views on money support your new mindset. So that's like ditching the materialistic friend because that's really tough to be around. It's exhausting to be around. Mm -hmm. I also think that if you are trying to really create a healthy relationship with money and everybody around you is you know, constantly talking about money from the standpoint of how much they make and you know, if they don't make enough, they're not important or they want to have all the things or like the friend who's always talking about all the online shopping, she's doing this and that, that it's like basically swimming upstream with like a very, very strong current. Like it's going to be really hard to make progress toward this new mindset and this healthy relationship when you surround yourself with people who have very unhealthy relationships with money. They, they are using money to feel, you know, good about themselves. And, mm-hmm. and that is a losing game. Mm-hmm. And we talk about those like circle of champions or the people around you in like a few episodes. I think it was like two episodes ago in our relationships power move. And we go into depth kind of about like how to audit that group of people in your life. So if you guys want, check that out. Everything in your life comes down to sort of like, you know, the habits you repeatedly do, the people you repeatedly hang out with, you know, Mm -hmm. the, the phrases that you repeatedly tell yourself. I mean, I wish that there was like this magic pillar button we could push and like it wasn't based on just like consistently putting in the work. I wish it could Mm -hmm. just be like we snap our fingers and it's done, but it doesn't work like that. And I think lastly, just, you know, to kind of wrap up a a beneficial way to help you stop feeling like your self-worth equals your net worth is to create a really healthy money mantra. I mean, mine is literally just my self-worth does not equal my net worth. I also do not ever say ask for your worth. Like you will not see that in the book. I always Mm -hmm. talk about your salary as being what you're being paid is the market value of your skill set, right? And so what I'm trying to separate is that feelings of you personally versus your skill set, right? Your skill set has a value on it, but you as a person are Mm -hmm. invaluable. And so, you know, I think it's for me, sometimes it's just having to say it to yourself over and over again. When you start to feel anxious about your finances, I think the other thing is that once you can separate this, some of these financial fears or anxieties that you have, it's not that they go away, but they're managed, right? Like instead of being frozen and not being able to make a move, um, maybe you you step into this powerful place of owning your net worth situation and kind of recognizing like, this is just a thing that I can grow, that I can distribute, that I use to live my life versus like, this is the thing that makes me important. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really good to repeat this mantra when you're either um, in the job search process or you're like right before a job interview, or if you're just like returning to the workforce or are like new to it, maybe you just graduated college. Cause I feel like that's when it's toughest when people automatically place like, well, what's your, what's your worth in terms of salary? Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. So, all right. So after this quick break, now that you guys know how to separate your self-worth from your net worth, we're going to go over three money power moves that you can do today. I want to take a quick break to tell you again about the tool I depend on called Acuity, a scheduling assistant that makes it easy for traditional businesses to become virtual businesses as it works behind the scenes to fill your calendar 24-7. The thing I love about Acuity is that it makes me look so professional and I can trust it to be reliable. With Acuity, clients can book easily and Acuity will send booking confirmations with your branding and personalized messaging. And you can avoid scheduling back and forth because Acuity will even deliver text reminders and let clients reschedule on their own. I've even rescheduled for other people and it's super simple. Another thing that can take a lot of time is processing payments. You guessed it, Acuity does that for me too. Some other things that I really appreciate about Acuity and why I recommend it include Acuity links with all popular video conferencing tools like Zoom, GoToMeeting, Google Hangouts, etc. You can hook up Acuity to your social accounts like a Facebook page and people can book directly which is really valuable because you don't want to have all these multiple steps when it comes to booking with you. Also, Acuity will collect everything you need to know about a client as soon as they book. They also have enhanced scheduling pages that include photos alongside your services descriptions to really wow and inspire your clients. And you can get notified anytime a new appointment is booked just by checking checking your schedule right from your phone 
And you can even tell Acuity to automatically update your calendars that you already use like Google or Outlook. So again, like this is going to streamline your life so much. Like it's, it's amazing. And if you're trying to transition your company into virtual or need to streamline your virtual business, Acuity Scheduling deals with the day-to-day drudgery so you can focus on what's important. For a limited time only, you can get 45 days of Acuity Scheduling absolutely free, no credit card required. All you have to do is go to acuityscheduling.com slash females. That's acuity, A-C-U-I-T-Y, scheduling.com slash females, F-E-M. A-I-L-S. All right, now let's get back to the show. Our first money power move is to assess your financial picture. Sometimes we have fear around finances that just builds and builds until it gets to a point where it seems really overwhelming to tackle. As nerve wracking as it may seem, I'm here to tell you that ignoring your money will not make anything better. It will only exacerbate the problem. So you, the first money power move is to assess your financial picture by tracking your spending habits, identifying all the balances from your accounts, checking your credit score, and, and facing your debt. And this is actually a really good tip I got from Gabby Dunn, who was on the podcast a couple of seasons ago. She wrote this book called Get Your Financial Shit Together. One of the things she recommended is to actually just print everything out um, and have like physical paper and where you can like literally see where you were spending your money. And you have to do this for, I think she recommended for like a whole 12 months. I, I think a full 12 months is probably the best way to actually get the full picture because every month there's always something. So you can't mm-hmm. just go off of you know one month where your car broke down because that doesn't happen every month. You want to really assess your whole financial picture and knowing where everything is. Just I think just knowing who you owe, where you owe, what the interest rates are, you know, what your debt is, all of that just is incredibly mm-hmm. empowering just just as a good first step. Yeah. It's kind of like whenever I I don't know, catch a subscription that I forgot to unsubscribe to or whatever and I cancel it. I feel so powerful immediately after. I'm like, wow, I'm so on top of it. Like just finding where you're like small ways you're losing money, I think is great. <laughs> it's such a good feeling. It's such a gotcha moment. You're like, gotcha. I know yeah. I'm gonna cancel you. <laughs> yeah. I like that. The other one, I I remember when I did this, because again, I, I was like the guinea pig for all the tips I gave in the book. When I did this, I also started to see that I was spending a lot of money on parking. So, you know, back in the days when we would drive places, Los Angeles parking is not cheap. And like, you know, I would pay for a monthly parking pass at at work. And then I would also be going around town and I would pay here and there. And like, it was adding up to a lot of money. And so even though... I'm paying for this monthly parking pass. When I started to like look at all this, like I finally just got savvier about where I met people, adding in time for parking. I started walk like if I could walk mm-hmm. anywhere, if it was like under two miles and I had free parking. So if, like when we go podcasting, you know, we get free parking mm-hmm. if anywhere I was meeting people that was under two miles, I would walk there. You yeah. know, like yeah. I know that these are all these sound silly, but like honestly, just the fact that I knew, like I knew it, and then it was sort of like a gotcha, like I'm doing this thing that's going to save me this much over time felt really, really, really good. Yeah. I also, in terms of tracking spending, I started using Albert. And I know we have an article on Career Contessa about like different financial apps that were very helpful, but I, I started using Albert also kind of like as an experiment. I still have it and it truly has like helped me so much. That's like a savings one too, where it just like puts a little away each week. The amount's always different. It just depends on how much you made or spent that week. So it's never like something huge that you can't manage. It's, it always is like proportional to what you net that week. So yeah. it's been super helpful. And they also have like savings goals and stuff. And they are not a sponsor. I'm speaking like they are a sponsor right now, but I genuinely like have a good experience with them. And I think they also have like an added premium thing where you could basically be paired up with like an Albert genius and they just answer questions that you have. So like you could just text them essentially and be like, how do I lower my student loan payment? And they'll be like, okay, have you done this and this and like walk you through it. So it's like a good like beginner's sort of finance app. I think it's not like super complex. I think they just added like investing too, but I haven't really played around too much with that. 
But you would if they were a sponsor. But I would. (laughs) Albert. (laughs) Get Aaliyah Aaliyah Kamalova, free account. (laughs) (laughs) Just drop some money into it too. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) No, I, I, we, we do, we definitely have articles like that on Claire Contessa. And then the other thing, the little tips I remember when I was researching all this, it's like super simple stuff. Like, are you maximizing your 401k. Like there's so many little hidden things. And Mm -hmm. and anyway, we don't have to keep going into the tip, but the basic point is like carve out time, um, you know, an hour each week where you dedicate it to your financial development. You know, just like we talked about your career development, like spend an hour every week, just knowing where's your money going? What are you doing with it? I, I just feel like creating that as a habit is going to serve you so well. Mm -hmm. And you do eventually want to get to a place where you are able to invest. Again, that's kind of like a whole other topic, but these are the ways that you are going to have financial independence and that will give you the flexibility for career moves. You know, if you want to start a side hustle slash full-time hustle, you want to lean in, lean out of the workplace, like all of those things are going to come down to you know, it takes money to live. So I don't want to be ignoring money, but Mm -hmm. you want to be able to have choices and options. And I feel like so many people in this community are always asking us like, how do I make sure that I'm not limiting myself? Like your financial health is one of the ways you're not going to limit yourself. Right. And okay, last thing I promise I'm going to say about this during this like quarantine period right now, when everyone's way at home uh, way more often than they used to be right now, it's like a really great time to evaluate your monthly expenses from like March till like May ish and compare it either to like last year or like January. Ooh, February. that does sound kind of fun. I did that yesterday because I was like, in my mind, I was like, I just keep assuming that I'm spending less because I'm just like, oh, I'm not driving around, I'm not like doing anything that's like, movie theater or whatever. But I was like, I need to check if that's true. Cause then I'm like buying like furniture or whatever, like stuff around the house. I'm like, maybe that is just balancing out. Who knows? And then I look, it turns out I am spending way less money, which makes sense. But it's also a great way to, for a later date to be like, what can I permanently remove? Like when your life kind of right. resumes back to normal, it's like, what are some things that you've learned through this process that you may not need to spend money on? Yeah. We put something on Instagram the other day about unique ways to save money. And Mm -hmm. somebody said that she's saving $3,000 every month right now because she, well, part of that was like childcare, Mm -hmm. gas, eating out. She cancels certain subscriptions. Like, I mean, can you, I mean, again, I'm sure, I'm sure the bulk of this is like childcare, but yeah like parking for work, like all these little things. So that would actually be a really fun experiment. I'm going to do that. Mm-hmm. Just for... Yeah. I just like went on to <laughs> I want to like, feel rich. I think, I think on like Chase, they literally break down like by like what you spend it on. They g- generate these little like pie graphs. So I was just like comparing them and I was like, all right. But it's really funny to see how like my entertainment went down. It's all just like food groceries. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So, but it, which feels more valid, but yeah. So it's a super interesting experiment that I did that I think everyone should do. I'm here to tell you about one of my favorite non-career related companies, Majuri. This might surprise many of you, but I really love jewelry. I find it to be an easy way to upgrade my work from home look, but I'm also somewhat particular about the jewelry. I want it to be polished, but not distracting. I want it to be delicate, but I definitely don't want it to break on me. That's why I love Majuri. They make fine jewelry for everyday wear that's ethically sourced and made to last. Their selection is always changing with weekly editions thoughtfully made in small batches. Think 14 karat solid gold staples, everything from light as air hoops to barely there chains made for layering. Plus sterling silver, pearls, diamonds, and even wedding bands for you or them. Traditional jewelers launch seasonal releases, but Maduri drops new pieces every Monday instead that include minimal classics as well as bold statement pieces. So you can always be mixing it up. It's really awesome. And a major bonus is that when you purchase your jewelry from Majuri, you're also supporting a female-led company with a team that's over 80% female. If you haven't done so already, I highly recommend, as does Elle, Vogue, Business of Fashion, and you know some legit others, I would definitely recommend checking out Majuri. Their Instagram page is also really great for gathering inspiration for how to style your jewelry. And if you've ever joined us on a webinar or seen me on any of our videos, I'm almost always wearing multiple Majuri pieces. So head to Majuri.com slash females or use the code females, F-E-M-A-I-L-S at checkout for 10% off your first order. That's Majuri, M-E-J-U-R-I 
com slash females for 10% off your first order. All right, now let's get back to the show. So our second money power move is to research your work value. This means taking the steps to know that you are receiving compensation in line with what value you slash your skills bring to work. So this is more of like your salary value. Yeah. And I, I think this is something people think about only when they're interviewing for a new job or mm-hmm. they are going to negotiate their salary. But this is actually something that you can be doing right now just to get a better idea of like, what is the market value of my skill set? Maybe you got hired you know, a year ago or two years ago or 10 years ago, and you've never really thought about this and you've just taken the raises as they come. You know, So this is just something you can... I just want to point out, you can do this regardless of if you're thinking about negotiating a raise or not. In order to do this, you're going to want to start by talking to people. We also have our own anonymous salary database that's completely free on Career Contessa. It's called The Salary Project. If you fill out... I think it's like a 10 question, but like a little survey and ask you about your own salary. You know, It's basically crowdsourced. You give us some information. Once you do that, we'll give you access to the entire database. So there's over 60,000 real salaries in there from real people. So you can start and then you can like basically sort them by job function, location, all the things that you mm-hmm. like more details that actually are important to take into account. So, you know, maybe someone living in New York City who works as an account manager, their salary is going to be higher than someone who lives in Omaha, Nebraska, for example. Mm-hmm. The next thing I would definitely recommend, I mentioned the salary project because so many people are uncomfortable talking about money with their friends mm-hmm. that I I think that tools like the salary project are a good way to tiptoe into the deeper end of the pool. The next thing you can do once you start, you know, seeing what you think is, I would say like stick to a range. You don't need to come up with an exact number, but a range. Then the next thing is start talking to your friends about how much money they make. The reason why I like starting with friends is because you already feel more comfortable talking to them. So it doesn't necessarily mean that your friends have to work in the same industry or job title or anything like that. Just asking them how much they make and sharing how much you make is a good step again, like stepping stone into getting to the place where I'm sure Leah is about to say next. But the point being is like, those are two things that you could do today that are easy, seamless. And the goal is that you're going to be working toward understanding what is the range for your specific job, industry, company, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that's like reaching out to peers in similar industries, which this is like more difficult or like intimidating rather. You may not be as close and there is still like this stigma against like talking about salaries openly. And also, you know, it's even more complicated if it's like the only peers you know within the industry right now are like your coworkers. So that's also going to be a kind of a weird thing where it's like, if you start to realize how much so-and-so is being paid. But I think the key is to just be as open as you can And to approach it again with that like mantra of that your net worth is not your self-worth. Just so you have like an even like I'm researching right now. Obviously, it's no secret that there's a huge like wage gap between men and women. But part of the way that gets smaller is by having conversations around salaries, especially when you're speaking to peers ask men to ask all different kinds of people because that does unfortunately like weigh on salary. Yeah. And the way I like to do this is once you get more comfortable talking about money, now it's time to reach out to the peers. So let's say you are a tech recruiter and you work at a tech company, go find another tech recruiter that works at a different tech company. So don't start with your company right away. I I feel like I always like to start on the outer edges and like Mm -hmm. work my way toward the center. And I would reach out to that person, build a relationship with them. Hopefully you've already know somebody else who works at another company. Get on the phone with them or Zoom because I do feel like this is one of those conversations that is better delivered when you can see the other person. And I always like to kind of word it as like, look, you know, I'm in the process of just kind of researching the market value for a tech recruiter that does this with this many years of experience. You and I are kind of in a similar situation. Would you be open to talking about salary with me just so I can learn more? I'll share my findings with you as well. So from there, they're going to say yes or no. If they say yes, then okay, you've been given basically the green light to ask about it. If they say no, then fine. You can respectfully say like, hey, I totally get that. I respect that. No problem. And I'm sure for the person, they're not going to just say no. They're going to give you all these reasons on why they don't want to do it, but it's totally fine. Everybody's going to become more comfortable with salary transparency at their own rate. And the last thing we, a while ago at Career Contest, someone basically said, 
wrote us an email and said like, I was an intern for this company. Now I'm going to go full time. And they basically asked me like, (laughs) what salary do I want? What a dream scenario, by the way. (laughs) And we put it out on the internet. We were like, oh my God, like, is there a salary equation? And this woman wrote us back and she was not only had years of experience as a hiring manager and a, a leader, but she was in a VC firm. So we really liked her answer and we shared it in the book as well. But she said the basic salary equation that you can come up with is add up your monthly expenses, double it, and then add 20% because women usually earn 20% less than men. So that's not an exact science. Please don't at us for the fact that we're giving you that salary (laughs) equation. The idea is that this is a place to start. Add up your monthly expenses, double it, and then add 20%. And that is at a minimum the salary range that you are going to want to earn because obviously... And like when we say add up your monthly expenses, don't start adding extra... Like, well, I... Right now, my apartment is fifteen hundred dollars a month, but I'd really like to be able to afford a four thousand dollars a month apartment. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, don't don't cheat and make this all of a sudden a lot higher because that just gives you an idea of what you need in order to live. And then, of course, you're going to want to continue to do that research to understand what is the market value of that skill set. And you might also do all this and realize, like, hey, the market value for this skill set, I want to make more, or I need mm-hmm. to make more. And so you might start recognizing, okay, now I need to research skill sets that actually do make more money. I mean, the salary mm-hmm. project is a really good example of a place where you could do that to find out what jobs make more. So all of that in, in a nutshell, obviously it's expanded a lot more in the book, but you always have that salary equation to, to fall back on. So our third is to money power, maybe I should say, is to negotiate. A recent study out of the University of Texas found that when women negotiate for themselves, they tend to ask for smaller salaries than men do, or they themselves do when they're advocating for others, which yeah. is, I feel like, so typical for us, right? <laughs> <laughs> really sad, but like makes sense. <laughs> I think it's like time- we can we can fight for other people, but when it comes to advocating for ourselves, we're always a little like, uncomfortable. Please, sorry to bother you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's definitely, I think it comes from a practice. And going back to like our point that we just mentioned about like researching your work value, if you have that ready to go, that's like the ultimate ammunition to ask confidently for what you need, because that's just facts. That's just proven data that you've collected. And it's hard to negate that in any way. Obviously, there's different circumstances within the company, but this at least will help you have the confidence to know that what I'm asking is absolutely reasonable. You know, it's not crazy or I don't know, too much or anything. Because it's like, I'm just going based off facts. Well, I think sometimes too, if you are nervous or you do feel like you're overreaching, when you do that research, it makes you feel confident to recognize I'm not overreaching. Like mm-hmm. not at all. Like there is a there's a comfort in knowing that what you're asking for isn't going to be like disputed as a like an overreach, you know? Mm-hmm. So and just so you guys know, we'll put it in the show notes, but we have a template for how to ask for a raise. It's called the gimme. And it's literally, it's not a template, sorry, it's a script. So we literally will tell you like, here are the steps to take. Here's how you can practice and ask for that raise. If with with your research, you realize, hey, I need to negotiate. I need to go and talk to my boss. So it's an awesome resource. And people have used it. We've gotten so many notes from people who have not just used the salary project, but also our gimme script. And they've asked for a raise and they've gotten it. And some of these raises that people have gotten are huge. Like, yeah, they're actually crazy. I'm like, wow, yeah. that's a huge jump. <laughs> it's like 50% increase. Or uh, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. You're like, where, where do you work? I want to negotiate there. You needed um, this. Like it yeah. was for you. <laughs> this is, I'm so glad they got that. <laughs> With everything that's happening in the world right now, I've been taking a really close look at my subscriptions. I'm sure you are too. One of the subscriptions that I really love is Causebox. Causebox is a quarterly, that means four times per year, subscription box curated by women for women that is filled with all sorts of amazing products that are ethical, sustainable, and have a positive mission to give back and make the world better. This means supporting female-owned companies, which have never needed our support more than now. Every cause box is limited edition and comes with six to eight full-size products. You can get everything from skincare and jewelry to homeware and accessories. I got my own sample box and here are just a few of my favorite things that were in it. An organic scarf from Bloom and Give that I now use to also cover my mouth while I walk. A travel wallet in this great terrazzo print that I can't wait to use in the future. 
and a duffel bag from No Supply. Each cause box also comes with an exclusive magazine that tells the story and mission behind each product in the box. One of the best parts was just getting my cause box in the mail because they ship it right to your door for free. Opening it and feeling like I got myself this huge surprise bundle of gifts, which now more than anything, is just sort of what I needed as like a little pick me up. I'd get this for myself. I'd get this for my mom, sister, friends. In fact, I just got this for my mom's birthday. It really is my new favorite subscription. And we also love seeing our listeners getting their cause boxes. So if you get one, don't forget to tag us at Career Contessa and let us know what were your favorite products. For me, it's definitely the canvas duffel bag, but that you know could get beat in the next box because again, every box just keeps getting better and better. The best part is that, of course, we got our listeners an exclusive discount. All you have to do is go to causebox.com backslash females and use the code females, F-E-M-A-I-L-S, get your first box for 30% off, as in you can get your first box, which is worth over $250 for less than $39 and free shipping. It's going to sell out. So again, go to causebox.com backslash females. All right, now let's get back to the show. Most of the time you're... I mean, maybe your company is going to give you a raise once a year based on like how they do bonuses and raise, you know, like part of the schedule. But like, if you don't ask, there's a very, very high probability that it will just be something that never gets talked about or, Mm -hmm. you know, like it's very, very rare for you to recognize that you're being paid less or for you to be saying like, Hey, I did research in the market value of my skill set. I'm not there. And for your boss to be like, Oh, well, like we were planning on changing that. Usually it's like, you're going to have to initiate the conversation. So when you do that, just make sure that it's something that is part of a very planned process, like scheduling a time on the calendar, giving them the heads up that you want to talk about your salary. Like mm-hmm. don't do this on the fly in like a just, you know, text conversation. Yeah. Cause it's so easy to just kind of like chicken out. <laughs> but if you yourself yeah. have scheduled a one-on-one meeting with your manager, like a week from today, then it's like, yeah, you have to go in ready and prepared to make the ask. And um, in terms of preparing don't just like practice it in your head or say it out loud, like record it and listen to yourself. Because I think especially with negotiation, when people get nervous, it's just like, let's just continue talking until they say something that makes it seem like it's okay what I'm saying. So I think there's just like, practice those pauses where you're like, state the fact and that's it. Like, you don't need to yeah. be like, well, actually, never mind. And then you end up just walking out like <laughs> with no results or it's unclear what you wanted. Oh, yes. Make it very clear what you want. So go in knowing what your range is. The other thing I would say that I've learned in negotiation is make your ask and then stop talking. Mm -hmm. Like I do this thing where sometimes when I'm nervous, I will make my ask, but then I'll I'll start putting all these like little extra filler words Mm -hmm. either before, during or after kind of thing. And it's so much more powerful to make a very strong, simple statement than it is to have like a real jumbled paragraph. So or like just like adding a simple. laugh or something at the end, just because you're nervous. It's like all of a sudden it's like, wait, do you want this or no? Right, right, and and it's it's incredibly uncomfortable to just stop mm-hmm. talking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Try it. You'll hate it, but it's it works. I promise. <laughs> all right, so let's recap. Our three money power moves are number one: assess your financial picture. Number two, research your work value, even if you're not, you know, interviewing for a job or thinking about asking for a raise. And number three is to make sure that you are negotiating. And when you do, just do it in a really prepared way. Practice it, record yourself saying it, make your ass and then stop talking afterwards. Okay, so next up, we hear from you and solve your problems. Welcome to Dear Career Contessa, the part of the show where we answer your questions. Remember, if you have a career question, you can submit it to us via DM at Career Contessa on Instagram. You can email us info at careercontessa.com or leave a voicemail at 844-FEMALES. All of that information is also included in the show notes. 
Today's question came to us via Instagram DM. As most of you (laughs) have realized, you prefer to send us questions that way, which is cool. I actually really like it. Okay. So this question was, how can I succeed in my career despite the lack of team playerness? That's a word she said, uh, of the department heads in my building. I feel confident in my work. However, the department heads in my building don't seem to believe in their staff and tend to not listen to what is said. I want to show them what I can offer without having a conflict of personalities. Oh, that is a tough one. Mm-hmm. I I mean, sounds like the people in your work need to get some leadership slash management training, but yeah. that's not your question. <laughs> you take them to our management course. You just email them a course and everything should be resolved. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I think for me, what's really standing out in her question is she says they tend not to listen. And yeah. We've done a lot of episodes. We literally, all we do is think about your guys' careers all day long. <laughs> and almost everything I've realized comes down to like a couple central themes. And listening is definitely one of those central themes. Like most people are terrible listeners and it's so important to truly listen and, yeah. and learn how to be a good listener. And that's especially important for managers and leaders. It's also, of course, important for employees because you'll probably be a manager at some point. But this word that's standing out to me the most. And when other people are not good listeners, I think that means that the way you communicate to them matters even more. Because they only they can't hear you unless you communicate in the way that they can, right? Like your message gets lost unless you communicate it in a way that they hear it. And it seems like her situation is just like a very separated, like maybe executives and like non executives is what it seems like, like a lack of team playerness. I wonder if there's something that like there's programs at your company that you can participate in that kind of allows you to bridge that gap a little bit maybe, or just having like informational interviews with maybe someone that's kind of higher up just to like build that 